Hola, mi amigos de Chile. Hello, my friends from Chile. This is an almost unedited movie of the dissection, the endoscopic middle and inner ear uh, dissection that we performed uh, in Viña del Mar this year, 2015, uh, for the National uh, Congress of Otolaryngology and had an ex surgery of Chile. So, as you can see, we are using a 3 millimeter, 14 centimeter endoscope and we are visualizing through the external auditory canal the tympanic membrane. Uh, of course, uh, this was after cleaning the external auditory canal and removing the, the hair from the external auditory canal because otherwise uh, if you have wax or if you have hair uh, even the dissection and the surgery can be very difficult to perform to be performed in a very safe and effective way because every time that you put your endoscope uh, the lens of the endoscope may be smeared by the hairs and of course you lose all the image capabilities that you have on the endoscope so this video has approximately one hour and 15 minutes and we are going to discuss both the middle ear endoscopic anatomy and the inner ear endoscopic anatomy as well as the inner ear transcanal endoscopic approaches. As you can see, we are using a suction elevator freer. This instrument is from the IWGES uh, kit from Corp Stores. So uh, this is a very useful instrument, but to tell you the truth, sometimes you don't need uh, special instruments to perform the surgery. As a matter of fact, to start the surgery, you just need an endoscope and the instrument tray that you already have for ear surgery. As you progress uh, towards more complicated uh, procedures, you will feel and you will need some special instruments. And this one can help a lot uh, this suction elevator freer in some cases. So we were checking the anatomic position and then this is the surgical position. This is a left ear that we are dissecting. Anterior is uh, in 12 o'clock if, if we may do say it so. Uh, superior it's, it's about 3 o'clock. Inferior it's about 6 o'clock and posterior it's about uh, 6 o'clock and, and, and inferior is about 9 o'clock. So we are doing a tympanon metal flap and when we talk about tympanon metal flap this is actually a very a big tympanon metal flap for dissection purposes. Uh, depending on the case that you're going to perform the surgery uh, you may have a very big tympanon metal flap or a relatively small tympanon metal flap uh, depending on the case uh, mainly. If there is a cholesteatoma case, which is the main application for endoscopic ear surgery, we always start the surgery in the middle ear and clean the middle ear first. If the cholesteatoma is big, small, doesn't matter. We always start with the middle ear and we always like to do a, a, a bigger flap, uh, especially anterior, because if you do a bigger flap, you can remove the tympanometal flap completely from the malleus and it facilitates you the dissection of the retraction pocket cholestatoma or the cholestatoma. So in this case, we are doing a very big flap, a very anterior flap, in order to uh, remove completely the tympanometal flap from the tympanic membrane and also in order to inspect the anterior uh, parts of the middle ear cavity. So if this case would be a stapes case or another case uh, I wouldn't do a, a, a flap like this a big flap like this because uh, as long as the flap is you have to remember that in surgery, in live surgery this is actually one of the most difficult steps of the operation because it's the step that bleeds, that bleeds more so uh, depending on the case that you're going to perform surgery it's better to do a bigger or a smaller flap, depending on the uh, exposition that you want to get uh, in the middle ear spaces. So in this case, we are doing a very big flap. And of course, you have to go a little bit anterior. And of course, if you have uh, a, a not very good ear canal, it can be done, of course, but it's going to, uh, you have, you, you are going to have a little bit of more difficulties to create this uh, tympanomiato flap. 
and uh, you can use other types of instruments such as round knives and uh, other types of instruments to create and to elevate this tympano metal flap. In live surgery, sometimes if we don't have a suction elevator freer, it's very useful to use a cotonoid, an adrenaline soaked cotonoid. You put adrenaline and uh, you have a small piece of cotonoid and this cotonoid can dry up the field in a very nice way that you can even not using suction you can have a very dry field. So in this part here and this is one of the great advantages of the endoscope first of all everyone sees what you're doing so for teaching purposes this is very nice for residents and even uh, the anesthesiology pay attention at the surgery but of course you see things so now we are seeing uh, the annulus uh, region and we are trying to elevate the annulus to try to expose a little bit the middle ear cleft and of course uh, in the most superior part you have the posterior malleolar spine the posterior malleolar spine is a, a bony bridge, a bony ridge, a bony spine that uh, is the birthplace or it's one of the birthplaces or it's one of the uh, attachments of the posterior malleolar ligament so in the dissection and also in live surgery most of the times we can see the posterior malleolar ligament and uh, we end up cutting the posterior malleolar ligament just to have more space especially if you're going to create a big flap like this so sometimes you need to clean the endoscope and of course using a small hook or using a small pick or using a rosin uh, instrument you can go inside the middle ear cleft and once you go inside the middle ear cleft you have a very good view or you have a very good view of the ossicles especially the long process of the incus and the stapes. The incoduma uh, uh, malleolar joint is a little bit more difficult to see in this step of the operation but the incoduistapedial joint is very easy to see uh, once you elevate uh, this uh, tympanometal flap putting the annulus a little bit more anterior. So in this part here we identify the corda tympani, the long process of the incus is there uh, the corda tympani is just in the right side of, 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 of our surgical field you can see already the round window niche the incoduistapedial joint is a very well uh, seen here and you can actually see the reflex of the, the round window reflex on the water uh, nearby the round window just elevating a tympanometal flap and here we are going to see the posterior malleolar spine the, posterior, the corda tympan is there, the posterior malleolar spine is over there and the posterior malleolar spine is a very nice anatomical landmark for the posterior malleolar ligament that uh, connects the posterior malleolar spine to the uh, malleus. So we elevate a little bit with the suction elevator freer or you can use a round knife or you can use another type of instrument just to elevate and then you can see a little bit better the posterior malleolar uh, spine very well seen. I, I call it uh, uh, the shark fin because for me it reminds a shark uh, fin, the, the dorsal shark fin of those uh, fishes. So you elevate the tympanometal flap, you see this shark fin which is the posterior malleolar spine and you see the posterior malleolar ligament and once you see the posterior malleolar ligament you just uh, with a hook or with a small uh, scissor or a uh, cutting instrument you just uh, cut uh, this ligament to release a little bit better the tympanic membrane from the malleus and in order for you to have more space to work and to elevate the whole tympanic, tympanometal flap from the malleus. So we are now trying to elevate, you can see the promontory region over there, you can see already the cochleariform process almost in the center of the dissection and here uh, we can see the posterior malleolar spine and the posterior malleolar spine was so attached to the posterior malleolar ligament that once we break the posterior malleolar ligament sometimes the posterior malleolar spine comes uh, especially in the cadavers of course uh, with uh, this dissection and then we can see the incodomalilia uh, joint and uh, this uh, uh, articulation between the malleus and the incus and we expose a little bit better the malleus cutting the, the posterior malleolar ligament and of course we elevate a little bit more the flap in a more anterior way to try to peel the tympanometal flap and the tympanic membrane all the way from the malleus so we open here and uh, we also understand and see 
one of the entrances of the Prusak space, which is a little bit more anterior. We see the cochlear foam process over there uh, with the uh, tensor tympani tendon, uh, very well seen in a very nice position. And we see and we understand, we see the cog over there in the superior part, uh, and then we see uh, the isthmus, the tympanic isthmus, the main isthmus, the main ventilation route that connects the middle ear cavity and the mastoid cavity. So we have this istimu, the tympanic istimus. We have the anterior uh, ventilation route that passes through uh, the cog and the cochlear form process. And sometimes this route is blocked by the tensor fold. In this case, it appears not to be blocked with the tensor fold. And we have the posterior route, the posterior isthmus, that uh, goes from the incondyostapedio joint to the facial uh, recess. So we have three main ventilation routes. And of course, these are very important roots. This is the posterior isthmus. And as you can see, you can see already the facial nerve in its position and uh, very well seen in a very beautiful way. This is the, uh, uh, the, the stapes tendon. And of course, the stapes tendon comes from the pyramidal aminescence that you can see over there. And you can already see the ponticulus. The ponticulus divides the posterior sinus that from now on we are going to call the anterior sinus from the sinus tympani. So now we are opening here this region that can open the Prusak space for you and of course we are going to elevate completely the tympanic membrane from uh, uh, the malleus. So you see the incodomalleolar joint over there, you see some ligaments of the malleus and of the incus to support the malleus and to support the, incus, uh, uh, the incus in a more superior way and you can see here uh, of course, we didn't create anything at this time and uh, we just elevated uh, a medium-sized tympanometal flap. But you already can see, and this is the beauty of it, you can see sinus tympani in a uh, not so good way, but you can see sinus tympani and you can suck some secretion inside. You can see the round window niche, sinus subtympanicum, posterior sinus, and facial recess. And these are very important areas when we talk about recurrence and residual disease in cholesteatoma. So endoscopic ear surgery, once again, this is the ponticulus region over there. In this specimen, the ponticulus was not very well developed. So it was uh, not absent ponticulus, but a small ponticulus. This is the sinus tympani region. And of course, we can work inside the sinus tympani with some instruments to see the depth of the sinus tympani, see your ponticulus and the sinus tympani that you can see and if you have disease you can work and remove disease inside the sinus tympani. Of course in this specimen we will correct a little bit more uh, to expose a little bit more but this is just elevating a tympanometal flap. Imagine to see the sinus tympani using a traditional approach. It's possible, you can see it but it's very difficult, it's more difficult and of course you have to do a more destroying uh, surgery, a more big surgery in order to expose this region and in order to work inside this region using a traditional approach. So you see the ponticulus, that is a brown bone ridge uh, over there near the, the stapes. You see the subiculum, which is here, the subiculum and you see the funiculus. So you have ponticulus, subiculum over there ponticulus over there and sinus tympani. So subiculum, funiculum, and this is the area that we call sinus subtympanicum. And in sinus subtympanicum, you have a very reliable, good anatomical landmark, which is called the fustis, which is over there, to the round window membrane. So when we talk about cochlear implants, and sometimes if you have, if you have difficulties in order to try to find, and in order to try to locate the membrane, the round window membrane, you can find the fustis even in malformation cases. You can find the fustis elevating a tympanometal flap, of course. You can find the fustis, and once you find the fustis, you find the round window niche. And then you have the funiculus, and between the fustis and the funiculus, in some cases, you have a space which we call the subcochlear canaliculus or the subcochlear tunnel. That in some cases can direct can go direct to you to the petrous apex region. So it's the ventilation uh, route or the ventilation airways to the petrous apex region. So sometimes if you have especially mesotympanic cholesteatoma or especially cholesteatoma in children, sometimes you have this uh, canal, this tunnel, 
and it's very good to inspect because sometimes you have cholestatoma inside and even doing a canal walk down procedure you can left cholestatoma behind this tunnel and in the future you can have a petrous apex cholestatoma so it's important to check it's important to understand this infracochlear route or this infracochlear approach to the petrous apex because otherwise you can use uh, of course in some other procedures such as to drain a cholesterol granuloma um, for instance if you have a small sphenoid sinus and the transnasal approach is not appropriate uh, if the patient has a normal hearing and you want to drain uh, and try to preserve the hearing you can use this infracochlear endoscopic transcanal approach uh, to drain uh, a petrous apex uh, cholesterol granuloma for instance or to have access to the petrous apex so you have the sinus tympani, sinus subtympani here the region of the facial recess and, and in this dissection the beauty of this the facial recess is no longer recess because you just elevate the tympanometal flap you just put the endoscope a little bit more and then you see the facial recess now we're going to correct a little bit trying to save the corda in the dissection most of the times we don't try to save the corda but during live surgery we try to save the corda of course uh, not to have some problems but in the dissection, we cut the corda to have more space, to create a little bit more space for us. And of course, this is very safe to use a curette. The, the facial nerve is very uh, protected, very down uh, and protected with bone. So with a small curettage, small bone removal, you don't need to remove a lot of bone. You can understand and you can see the facial recess and you can see how big can be your dissection or how big can be your view using an endoscope this is a zero degree three millimeter 14 centimeter endoscope a wide angle view endoscope but even with this small endoscope or even with this zero degree endoscope you can see the amount of view that we can understand just elevating a temperamental flap and just curating a little bit in some cases of course so endoscopic ear surgery is not that we are against microscopic ear surgery. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, we use microscopes in a quite often way when we have disease in the mastoid. Endoscopic ear surgery, endoscopes as a matter of fact, are a very interesting tool for the middle ear. We are not surgeons of a tool. We are not microscopic surgeons. We are not endoscopic surgeons. We are surgeons of the ear. If you use an endoscope and if you think the endoscope is a better tool, to do some tasks or some steps of the operation good for the patient so we use microscope and we use endoscope and endoscopic ear surgery in my opinion is just a rediscovery of the beauty of the middle ear anatomy the middle ear which is the birthplace of most inflammatory conditions in the ear especially cholesteatoma the cholestatomas, they always start in the middle ear, they don't start in the mastoid, they happen to be in the mastoid sometimes, but they always start in the middle ear. So to understand this anatomy, in my hands, in my opinion, is paramount to understand the treatment of the cholestatoma. Of course, you have the ponticulus over there, you have the posterior crust, the anterior crust of the stapes, facial nerve, very well seen, just above, sinus tympani in a very good way, facial recess over there, uh, this is the anterior pillar, Finicles over there, Fustis, Fustis over there, this is the subcochlear canaliculum, this is the sinus subtympanicum, sinus tympani, and posterior sinus. The posterior sinus is a region that goes from the ponticulus to the cochlear form process and the helpout tympanic cells. The promontory is over there, very well seen, the Jacobson nerve, and of course you can see the protympanic space and the eustachian tube opening, and as well as the carotid artery over there, the internal carotid artery, in a very good way. Uh, doing like this. So the posterior part, which is a very important part when we talk about cholestatoma, when we talk about residual disease or when we talk about recurrence, this posterior part is very easily seen just elevating a tympanometal flap and in some cases doing a small curettage of this bone. So uh, in order to avoid some uh, radical procedures, sometimes or most of the times in cholestatoma, we start uh, in the middle ear and then we clean the cholestatoma from the middle ear, including uh, clean the cholestatoma from the sinus tympani, from the sinus subtympanicum, from the anterior parts, the supratubal recess. We clean everything. If the cholestatoma goes to the mastoid, there's no problem. Of course, 
you can do a complete front to back mastoidectomy inside out clearance of the cholesteatoma but it's going to take you more work so in our hands in our experience in our center here in brazil we just do a posterior uh, incision retroricular incision and do a small cortical mastoidectomy to remove the sac the cholesteatoma sac from the mastoid uh, cells trying to preserve as much as we can the mastoid cells and the mastoid mucosa because if the mastoid has still some cells, if the mastoid is a, a burning mastoid, is a, is a very, uh, if the mastoid has no cells, it, it doesn't matter. But if the mastoid has still some cells, I think it's very important to preserve some of those cells and to preserve some of those mucosa uh, in order to have a very good buffering system in the post-operative period and when we talk about gas exchange and when we talk about ventilation route. So now we elevate a little bit more the tympanometal flap from the malleus and we open the region of the Prusak space. So it's very important to understand the ventilation route to the Prusak space because the Prusak space ventilations come from the tympanic isthmus, of course, in a retrograde way, but most of the ventilation to the Prusak space comes from the anterior part or, or, or the anterior ventilation route that passes through the cog and the cochlear form process. Sometimes this anterior route is blocked by a tensor fold, which is a web that can be formed uh, from the cog to the tensor uh, tympani uh, tendon, and sometimes you can have blocks on this anterior route. If you have a block in this anterior route, but the tympanic isthmus is open, you will not have problems most of the times because you can have ventilation to the precise space in a retrograde way. But if this anterior ventilation route is closed and if you have blockage in the tympanic isthmus and if you have blockage in the posterior isthmus and then you can have problems. Of course, this ventilation theory and this ventilation routes are very important to understand because you can understand a lot of the inflammatory disease and inflammatory conditions that you have in the middle ear. But they are not the final answer of our questions, of all our questions, because if this was uh, to be true, if these ventilation routes would be the final answer of our questions, we that perform endoscopic ear surgery, we would not have, uh, we would have 100% of success. And that's not true. We don't have 100% of success because, honestly, I think there's one more uh, component in the system. It's rhinopharynx, eustachian tube, middle ear, mastoid system, air system. I think we understand a little bit better the rhinopharynx, we understand the middle ear, we understand the mastoid, but we don't understand the eustachian tube yet. So the eustachian tube for me is one of the most important things, one of the most important rings in this chain uh, to the system. And the eustachian tube, we know how to, we know the anatomy, we know the eustachian tube exists, we know its anatomy. We know sometimes how to diagnosticate some problems of the eustachian tube, um, uh, mostly uh, by uh, indirect uh, tests, but we don't know how to treat. There are some uh, surgeons that perform laser, some surgeons that perform balloon dilation through the nose, through the middle ear, but honestly, I think we still have to understand a little bit better the eustachian tube and we still have to understand a, li a little bit better the treatment of the eustachian tube in order to have a very good understanding of this air uh, system. Uh, nasopharynx, eustachian tube, middle ear cleft and mastoid air system. If we understand this, I think we will have better results because we will understand a little bit better the physiology and we will understand a little bit better the disease. So now, we are elevating the uh, tympano metal flap, the tympanic membrane, from the malleus. And the most difficult part when we talk about this elevation is to elevate this tympano metal flap from the umbus, because it's the part that is more, uh, most attached to the malleus. So uh, in a real patient, this actually is a little bit easier uh, to, to do in a, in a normal patient. In a cadaver, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. And of course, we move a lot the, 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 the ossicular chain in this case because uh, it's a dissection. So we want to do a very big exposition. In a real patient, sometimes we are more careful in order to not to move 
this ossicular chain very very much such as we are doing. Here you can see the anterior malleolar spine and the anterior malleolar ligament. So you see the Brussac space, the anterior malleolar ligament over there, and you can see the canal of the tensor tympani muscle over there, and just above the canal you see the supratubal recess. And the supratubal recess is different from the anterior tympanic space because it has a different mucosa and the mucosa over there as close as the mucosa is from the eustachian tube the mucosa has more immunological compounds as close as the mucosa is from the mastoid the mucosa has more respiratory compounds so this is also very important to try to understand and now we are trying to elevate the whole tympanic membrane from the malleus to expose uh, the whole middle ear cavity and of course this can be done and we do actually some, uh, some, in some cases when we want to have a good exposition. For instance, in Glomus tympanicum, uh, in my YouTube channel you, you, you can see some cases of Glomus tympanicum and uh, uh, you see um, uh, that I elevate the tympanic uh, metal flap just like this in order to have a very good anterior exposition in order to remove uh, and in order to cauterize, to bipolar cauterize the glom glomus tympanicum. So in this case, we didn't have in this dissection a Bellucci scissor. If I would have a Bellucci scissor, I would cut, simply cut the tympanic membrane from the ambus. But uh, now, with, with no Bellucci scissor, we are trying to um, uh, remove completely the tympanic mem membrane from the, the ambus region. And of course, it's a little bit more difficult, but also it can be done. Uh, uh, that's why I think uh, if you want to really start endoscopic air surgery, if you think it's important, if you think uh, you're going to have good results for your patients, uh, and of course uh, this is uh, very true, but if you think you want to start this, uh, you can start with simple cases of course, uh, and the instruments that you have nowadays and the endoscope that you have, the sinus endoscope, are enough to start and start with small case. So now we can see the protympanic space and yet it's an anatomy yet to be uh, described, an endoscopic anatomy yet to be described in a very very nice way, this endoscopic uh, protympanic anatomy uh, which has very important landmarks I think in my opinion for the eustachian tube opening and for the internal carotid artery. So it's very important also to understand this. So. Once again, I think one of the main um, errors, uh, if I can say like this, is most of you that want to perform endoscopic ear surgery, most of you are very well uh, experienced and excellent microscopic ear surgeons. You can do a mastoidectomy, you can do an open cavity, you can do cochlear implants, you can do a translab approach to neuroma, you can do a lot of things uh, in a very, very nice way. But endoscopic ear surgery is more difficult and requires different sets of skills to perform. So if you have microscopic skills, this does not mean that the skills that you have, very good skills or excellent skills that you have, can be automatically transferred to the endoscopic skills that you need to perform a safe and effective surgery, endoscopic surgery. So, the main error that we have seen in those ears that we are performing endoscopic ear surgery is when we show this, okay, it's beautiful anatomy, you can understand the anatomy, you can understand the ventilation routes, you think this is important for your patients, okay. And you already do big cases, you are already a very well-known surgeon and you want to do a big case with an endoscope, but sometimes you don't have the endoscopic skills. And sometimes the surgery will not be good if you decide to go in this pathway if you decide to do as your first endoscopic surgery a big cholesteatoma for instance and then you can be frustrated and you can blame the endoscope you can say oh endoscopic ear surgery doesn't work it's very difficult very dangerous that's why we always recommend to start with smoke even if you are the best ear surgeon in the world you should start with small cases for instance start with ear tubes or small tympanic perforations and then, as you progress on your endoscopic skills, you can progress towards more difficult procedures. So, as you can see here, the sinus tympani, very beautiful, between the ponticulus and the subiculum, posterior sinus over there. So, you can have this very close-up view 
And in live patients, it's, in, it's, it's amazing because you can also see red blood cells and you can also see mucosidia clearance of the mucosa. So we can see the retro uh, spaces of the tympanic membrane. You can see the completely hetero spaces here, ponticles, subiculum, finiculus. You can see the fustis and you can see the subcochlear canaliculus. You can see the promontory. And of course, now we are going to remove and uh, this was not uh, supposed to be removed in block, but uh, I wanted to remove just the incus, but uh, I end up removing the incus and the, and the stapes in one uh, maneuver. So we are going to remove the incus. You have to think that in cholesteatoma, in most of the cholesteatoma cases, even in small cholesteatoma cases, the incus has uh, erosion, total erosion or partial erosion. So you have to remove the incus anyway. When you remove the incus, it's very nice. Of course, some cholesteatomas you have to preserve the incus. But when you remove the incus, sometimes it's very nice because you end up opening more the ventilation routes that you already have a blockage. So you are going to reconstruct at the end of the surgery, of course, sometimes in a second stage procedure or sometimes in the, in the same stage procedure. And when you're going to reconstruct, you have to think that you have to create a new isthmus. So when you reconstruct, and you can use bone, you can use a prosthesis, you can use whatever material that you want, but when you want to reconstruct, you have to think that you're going to create a new isthmus. And if you block this new isthmus, you can have problems in the future because you will still have two cavities, two different cavities, and you can have some difference of pressure and you can have a re-retraction pocket. So when you create a new isthmus, you have to understand that you have to create a new ventilation route and uh, most of the times a bigger ventilation route for you. So when we remove the incus, you can have a very big ventilation route now, a very big isthmus. But of course, you will reconstruct. And when you are going to reconstruct, you have to understand, reconstruct the cyclic chain, I mean. So when you're going to reconstruct the cyclic chain, you have to understand that you have to create this new isthmus and uh, of course you have to have a big space. So in this case, we remove the incus, the station tube is over there, the canal of the muscle, tensor tympanic muscle over there, supratubal recesses over there, brusac spaces over there. Here you see the tympanic spaces, anterior posterior tympanic spaces, and now with a zero degree endoscope, you can see the lateral semicircular canal, the tegment, lateral semicircular canal over there, adus adiantrum, and if you put an angle endoscope, even with a zero in the, uh, degree endoscope, you can see the antrum of the mastoid. And this is very important because sometimes this system is all preserved. You have a small cholestatoma, a small atical cholestatoma, and you don't need to do a mastoidectomy on those cases. You don't need to destroy a healthy system or a sometimes healthy system, air system, just in order to remove a small cholesteatoma. If you have a big cholesteatoma, and if the cholesteatoma goes all the way to the limit of the lateral semicircular canal, you can also remove completely transcanal, saving the mucosa of the mastoid and saving some air cells of the mastoid. But if the cholesteatoma extends beyond that, of course you can remove. If it's a retraction pocket, and if the retraction pocket doesn't open, if it's a non-infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, you can remove cholestatoma all the way from the uh, tip of the mastoid. But if the cholestatoma is uh, an infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, if you open the mastoid, uh, the, the cholestatoma sac, sometimes it's, uh, you need to drill. And sometimes, sometimes you need to drill the mastoid to open the mastoid to remove the cholestatoma, but if you can preserve some mucosa and if you can preserve some cells, I think that's very interesting and you can preserve the buffering system of, of the mastoid air system. So you can remove cholestatoma, you can create a very big aticotomy and you can do a front-to-back mastoidectomy on inside-out mastoidectomy, but at the end you will need to reconstruct. There are some surgeons in, the, in our group that perform this with very nice results and with very nice reconstruction. But you need to reconstruct. My philosophy when we deal with cholestatoma, and in Brazil we have big cholestatoma, is begin everything with the endoscope in the middle ear, clean the middle ear, and then if the cholestatoma extends to the mastoid, 
open the mastoid. Do a small cortical mastoidectomy to remove the remaining parts of the cholestatoma sac from the mastoid. But if you can preserve cells from the mastoid air system, preserve mucosa of the mastoid. If you can't, that's another discussion. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to do uh, an open cavity. But if you can, of course, preserve. Because uh, from the results and from the long-term results that we have like right now, six, seven year follow-ups, we think the results are very, very promising, very nice. And compared to canal wall down procedure. So you do a minimal invasive surgery. Most of the times you don't open the mastoid. Most of the times you can have a, a very nice hearing. The patient can go swim because you don't create an open cavity. And you have recurrence and residual rates when we talk about cholestatoma equal or better than canal wall down procedures. So when we remove completely the ossicular chain, you can see a 360 degree view. You see the cog, supratubal recess over there. And here you have uh, two different lines of sites. The dura is right over there. So the dura here, the region, is the, the dura is very low. So you have to take care of that and to understand that. So here you have two different ways of thinking when we talk about literature. So we can have the cog dividing the anterior tympanic space from the tympanic from the posterior tympanic space, or some author says that the cog divides the supratubal recess from the anterior tympanic space. Personally, I think the cog divides the supratubal recess from the anterior tympanic space. But if you think on the literature, if you search on the literature, you will find uh, both uh, things. So the cog is over there. This is the supratubal recess, in my opinion, and this is the anterior tympanic space in more posterior to the cog. So anterior tympanic space over there, cog, over there, cog is this bone ridge and the supratubal recess. In the supratubal recess, in the anterior tympanic space, the dura mater of the middle fossa is very low. So you can have a very thin bone, a very, very thin bone, and this is also one of the regions that we can use for the transcanal endoscopic supracochlear approach that can direct us also to the middle fossa and also uh, to the petrous apex uh, if you want. So, uh, of course, if you have disease. So, this approach is from the genicular ganglion, which is over there, right, abo right above the, the, the cochlear form process uh, and the dura of the middle fossa. Sinus tympan over there, round window niche over there, fustis uh, over there. This is the subcochlear canaliculum that you can see between the fustis and the funiculum. And you can see here the transcochlear approach, infracochlear approach root, and the supracochlear approach. Uh, between the geniculate ganglion and the middle fossa, uh, the, the dura of the middle fossa. So the middle for the, the supracochlear approach in that region over there. So you can have the supratubal recess over there, and the mucosa of the supratubal recess is very nice to understand. It's different from the mucosa of the anterior tympanic space, which is different from the mucosa of the posterior tympanic space, which is different from the mucosa of the mastoid antrum. So, cog is over there, uh, and you can see uh, the supratubal recess and the dura of the, 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 the middle fossa dura. It's a very, very uh, low dura and very easy to go inside. And since we removed the stapes, we already opened a part of the vestibule. So, uh, when you remove the stapes, you already open a little bit of the vestibule. So, we're going to suck a little bit the vestibule uh, and to understand the position of the spherical recess and the elliptical recess, which are very important structures and very important landmarks when we talk about inner ear procedures uh, for the superior and inferior vestibular nerves. So here you can see the dura of the middle fossa uh, by uh, transillumination of the, uh, uh, the, the tegmin cells. You can see the dura. In the, uh, the dura is the more gray thing. We use the curette a little bit just to remove a little bit of cells and you, you are amazed because the dura is very, very low. The lateral semicircular canal is over there and we can see the mastoid antrum in a very, very good way, in a very, very good position over there. Uh, and, of course, once again, we didn't do any uh, drilling, we didn't do any big curetting, just small articotomy and a small curetting, and we remo removed the ossicular chain and elevated the temporometal flap. So, uh, no retroarticular incisions were made whatsoever in this specimen, in this uh, cadaver. So, you can see the vestibule over there, it's open, 
uh, and uh, we can understand the position of the spherical recess and the elliptical recess. The spherical recess and the elliptical recess are very important anatomical landmarks for the uh, region, the attachment of the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves, which are very uh, nice nerves to understand and to understand their position in the internal auditory canal in order to, uh, when we talk about inner ear procedures or inner ear approaches, in order to understand. Now, we are using the curette to open the cochlea and to communicate the vestibule, to, to enlarge the communication between the vestibule and between uh, the cochlea. And this is very important also, very uh, nice to understand the position of the tympanic scalar and the vestibular scalar uh, and the scalar medium when we talk about uh, cochlear implants. And we, when we talk about positioning of the electrodes, as you can see, uh, you can see the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli. Scala vestibuli is superior, scala tympani is inferior, and the vestibule is over there. And of course, it's very nice to understand the angle of insertion of the electrodes and to understand also how you should insert because the position of the round window membrane and the position between the round window membrane and the scala tympani sometimes you can have an angle of almost 90 degree so the round window membrane is over there can you see and if you want to do a round window insertion sometimes you can have an angle a very acute angle and if you go very fast the electrode can pass the scala tympani and can go all the way to the scala vestibuli and, and hit the bone and then go to the cochlea uh, go to, to the other parts of the cochlea so uh, this most uh, first insertion of the electrode is very important depending on the on the way that you're going to insert depending on the angle that you're going to insert because uh, sometimes you can have uh, perforation of the scalar media by the electrode of the cochlear implant so it's very important to understand this anatomy not that you're going to use an endoscope to do a cochlear implant but all, just to understand the anatomy of the middle ear and the anatomy of the cochlea uh, to understand the position of the electrodes that you want uh, to understand for cochlear implants if you want to perform cochlear implant surgery. So you can open the vestibule over there and once you open the vestibule more you can see a little bit better uh, the, the uh, spherical recess, the elliptical recess, vestibular crest which is a bony crest between those two recesses and you can see the opening of the posterior semicircular canal. The opening of the posterior semicircular canal is more angulated, in a more right. Can you see is that black spot over there? Uh, here, about two hours, uh, this black part over there, you can understand if I put an angle endoscope and if I curate a little bit more, and if I have an, an angle uh, aspirator, we can aspirate this uh, blood over there, this uh, secretion over there, and you can have a very well seen uh, but you can see here the spherical recess and the elliptical recess, the vestibular crest, which is a bony crest between those two. Sometimes you can see some white spots that are autoconia, uh, and you can see uh, the posterior semicircular canal entrance in a very good way. So this is an angle endoscope, I think, and you can see better the posterior semicircular entrance uh, over there, uh, very, very well seen. And uh, you can see also one of the nerves possibly the superior vestibular nerve over there attaching uh, to the uh, one of the areas, the spherical recess and the elliptical recess uh, that are divided by the vestibular crest. Now we are going to open the most superior part of the cochlea. So to use a landmark to open this most superior part of the cochlea, I use the cochlear form process because it's going to be uh, right behind the cochlear form process. And as you can see, this is the first time that I'm going to actually use a drill. To use a drill and use an endoscope is not an easy task because you just have one hand and of course you have to take care with the tip of your endoscope not to break the endoscope. So the tip is here, you don't need to use high speed drill, you don't need to drill like 80,000 RPMs, you don't need that. You can put a small uh, RPM drill because otherwise if you put a very high speed drill you can have bone dust and you can have you can disturb your field of course uh, endoscopic ear surgery the second part of endoscopic ear surgery is relatively new so I think the companies will still make and we are trying to help some companies to make some instruments 
uh, that will uh, fill our needs uh, on endoscopic ear surgery. You have to remember when endoscopic sinus surgery or even in endoscopic skull base, anterior skull base surgery, sometimes you don't have correct instruments for some tasks that we are going to perform. So the companies are still uh, behind on those instruments, but we are working and uh, as we speak, they are uh, thinking in new instruments for this. So a drill with a suction and a drill with irrigation, a small drill with suction and irrigation can be very useful in this part here because you have to drill a little bit and then you have to irrigate and then you have to suck. And sometimes this can be very time consuming, uh, but of course we don't drill that much and uh, you have to use a very small drill and in this case we are using a diamond burr uh, just in order to open the small superior part of the cochlea in the dissection just for you to understand uh, the anatomy and the relationship between the cochlear form process relationship between the facial nerve and relationship between the modulus and the cochlear nerve we have already seen the position of the vestibular nerves which is in our right side uh, the attachments are the spherical recess and the elliptical recess and they are divided by the vestibular crest and now we are trying to open the most superior part of the cochlea using a drill and as you can see since we are using a small a very low RPM drill you have bone dust but you don't have bone dust going flying into your endoscope if we use a very high speed drill you can have a very bone, uh, bony dust uh, uh, environment bony dust flies into your endoscope and then you don't see anything it's like uh, you are in the middle of a snow of a heavy snowfall so uh, this is the way I do of course you can use other types of instruments such as the piezo device uh, an Italian device that you can uh, have underwater dissection you can do this actually drilling underwater drilling and uh, sometimes it reduces the, the amount of the dust and increases your view of course you have to have irrigation and suction in the same uh, field and a resident or assistant can uh, is uh, the one that's going to perform to you but you can perform underwater drilling and this underwater drilling can help you in order to try to understand a little bit better uh, the anatomy and in order to have a very uh, more a beautiful field uh, to dissect so in this case we are using a simple drill and I was uh, alone so I drill I irrigate and then I use the suction to clean up the bone dust but as you can see we already open the most superior part using the landmark uh, of the cochlear form process the cochlear form process is a very important anatomical landmark for two things for the apical turn of the cochlea which we are opening now and for the genicular ganglion of the facial nerve so it's very important to understand the position of the cochlear form process because below the cochlear form process you have the optical turn of the cochlea. Above the cochlear form process you have uh, the genicular ganglion region. And of course you can see here the both uh, scala, scala tympana and scala vestibuli. And the modulus is between those two uh, regions of the cochlea, the optical turn and the basal turn of the cochlea. You can see the modulus, you can have the modulus of course and you can have the attachment of the cochlear nerve which is a very important nerve also uh, to understand so now we are trying to open a little bit this superior part uh, of the cochlea and once you open the superior part of the cochlea you understand a little bit more the anatomy the cochlear anatomy and I think in my mind it's a very nice to try to understand the position of the cochlear implants and the position of the electrodes of the cochlear implant. So very very important to see a very very nice view of the cochlea and the vestibule over there uh, spherical recess, elliptical recess, the posterior lateral semicircular the posterior semicircular canal entrance over there sometimes if you open more you can see if you open more uh, in the inferior position you can see the cruz communis um, but you can understand a little bit the cochlear anatomy of, of course over there you can understand the way the electrode uh, has to go in inside the cochlea and of course you can understand the position of the modi modulus and understand the position of the cochlear nerve so uh, for anatomical uh, reasons and anatomical uh, demonstration we are now trying to open uh, the inner ear to do an uh, endoscopic transcanal 
transcochlear approach to the inner ear. This can be done for specific types of tumors that you can have uh, in this region. Of course, I think we need to uh, understand a little bit better this approach. We need to have better instruments, but if you are experienced on endoscopic ear surgeon and if you have the right case, like cochlear schwannoma or vestibular schwannoma, the patient is already deaf or the patient has uh, symptoms, un uh, untractable sy symptoms, and the patient wants to do this, I think it's a very nice way in order to uh, safely uh, remove a small tumor from the fundus. In my mind, one of the great applications of this transcanal, transcochlear approach can be, for instance, if you have a patient that is already deaf and the patient has residual tumor, if you do, for instance, a retrosigmoid approach and the patient has residual tumor at the fundus of the internal auditory canal, you can use this approach because it's a very easy, um, I would say, approach to do, easier than translabyrinthic approach or even than retrosigmoid approach. Uh, you can do this approach and once you do this approach, you, you are already in the fundus of the internal auditory canal. So the beauty of it is this. So now we are elevating the muscle of the, uh, the tympanic uh, tendon muscle. We are exposing the facial nerve here and we are elevating the muscle just to expose because below the muscle you have the great pretosal nerve. So we are now uh, elevating here the bone in order to try to expose the facial nerve is over there in order to try to expose the great pretrosal nerve that comes from the geniculate ganglion. So the geniculate ganglion region is over there and we are trying to expose a little bit better this uh, GPM, the great pretrosal uh, nerve. So the great pretrosal nerve runs following the muscle. So you just elevate the muscle, you open a bony canal and you see the GPM uh, in a very nice way uh, going uh, towards following uh, the muscle, the tympanic tendon uh, muscle that uh, goes all the way to uh, following also the eustachian tube. So you open here, you open this bony uh, ridge here and you can see the GPM over there. Oh, the very, very nice way, very easy way to see the great petrosal nerve uh, going from the genicular uh, ganglion uh, following the eustachian tube and following the muscle. So the great petrosal nerve is over there and the facial nerve is very important to understand this the facial nerve runs down, it doesn't go up or it doesn't go in the uh, position of the eustachian tube, but it goes down to the internal auditory canal. So the position of the internal auditory canal is very, very nice to understand. That's why I like to do this approach and I like to demonstrate this approach because even if you don't use this approach and uh, you use in a very uh, seldom cases of uh, very selected patients at this time, but even if you don't use this approach, you can understand the anatomy of this approach to try to understand the anatomy of the inner ear. So uh, the facial nerve runs in this position between the apical turn of the cochlea and between uh, the vestibular nerves. So the facial nerve runs in this position here and goes inside and goes down to the internal auditory canal. So it's very important to understand this. Now we're going to try to open the cochlea completely the cochlea to try to go to the inner ear. So if you want to open the cochlea in the most inferior part, it's easier to go directly to the inner ear. We're using a curette to be in a little bit more fast way. And once you curette a little bit more, you can see already the internal auditory canal. And once you see the internal auditory canal, you are already in the inner ear, in the internal auditory canal, of course. And you just need to understand the position of the facial nerve because it's the most important nerve that you want to uh, preserve. So the first nerve that appears to you is the cochlear nerve because you open uh, directly in, into the modiolus. So you see the, co uh, the cochlear nerve and then we open a little bit more to understand the position of the facial nerve. The facial nerve in this approach is good for you because it's kind of protected. It's one of the last nerves and one of the deepest nerves that are going to appear. So it's very important uh, when we talk about live surgery in this case because the facial nerve is well protected, it's way uh, behind. And of course, uh, in surgery, you're going to make a little bit more caution and uh, you're going to make uh, small maneuvers and use other types of instruments, more 
appropriate instruments to do this dissection. So you can already see the fission over there, deep, and of course you can follow the facial nerve all the way from the internal auditory canal to the genicular ganglion. So the cochlear nerve is on our left. Uh, we already removed a little bit of the cochlear nerve. The vestibular nerves are on the right. And the facial nerve, when we talk about, is almost in the center of the dissection here. So we have to understand the position of the facial nerve in order to understand this approach. So you can see facial nerve is, uh, is over there almost in the center of the dissection, cochlear nerve is on our left and cochlear nerve, the modal is already open so uh, we remove a part of the cochlear nerve and uh, we are washing just to clean, clean up the field so cochlear nerve uh, in the left, facial nerve over there in the center and if we open a little bit more right you will see the vestibular nerves superior vestibular nerve in a more right way and the inferior vestibular nerve. The superior vestibular nerve position is going to be a little bit more right than the suction over there. And the inferior vestibular nerve a little bit more down. But also to the right. And you can see already the internal auditory canal. You can enlarge this approach. You can have a bigger approach and you can see all the way from the external auditory canal to the brain stain. But, then there is always a but, you have to have a very an excellent, an excellent uh, experience in this kind of in endoscopic ear surgery. You have to do a lot of cholestatoma, you have to do a lot of endoscopically, a lot of surgeries to understand the anatomy, to understand the skills. This should never be your first uh, case. Oh, I have a cochlear shivanoma, I'm going to schedule to do it tomorrow because I saw your dissection video. Don't do this, please. But uh, some people want, to, and that's why I think uh, endoscopic ear surgery is very important, but it's very difficult because you cannot, even the, if you do translab, a retrosigmoid approach, transotic approach, microscopically, you will not transfer most of the times the microscopic skills that you already have into the endoscopic skills. So if you're not willing to accept that, if you're not willing to take some course, so facial nerve is over there, can you see facial nerve? Cochlear nerve is on our left, facial nerve going the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is over there, and the vestibular nerves are in this position here that I, I didn't open to see the vestibular nerves. So you can see the vestibular nerves in this position over there. So uh, talking about the skills, if you're not willing to take back uh, course, for instance, to try to understand. Can you see? I think there are two nerves there. The facial nerve is in the center and in the right you can see the superior vestibular nerve. But if you're not willing to take a course or to take a step back in order to try to understand, to learn endoscopic skills in order to have good results or more uh, better results for your patients, endoscopes are not a good tool for you. And actually you don't need endoscope because you are a very good uh, microscopic surgeon, so you have very good results. But of course, in my opinion, if you want to do a more minimally invasive procedure, and we are proving this with better results, even when we compare to radical mastoidectomies, for instance, when we talk about cholestatoma, I think endoscopes are the right tool for you. So you need to understand and you need to have skills endoscopic skills uh, and this can be achieved uh, during dissections uh, this can be achieved uh, during uh, life surgery we start with small cases of course and also you can visit some members uh, most of us members of the international working group on endoscopic ear surgery are very open for you to see uh, the surgeries to see the cases to see the post-operative to see the patients uh, we had had uh, visitors from many many different countries uh, from Argentina, from Colombia, from Peru, uh, uh, from India and uh, those visitors here from Europe and those visitors here they, they go to the office, they see the post-operative patients, they see the uh, otoscopy, uh, they ask the patients if the patients had pain, how was the experience during the surgery and they can see by themselves uh, the results. 
And of course, the other members that we have, we have members in America, have members in Canada, have members in Italy, uh, have members in France, in, uh, in India. The other members are just like us. They are very prone to receive uh, some uh, surgeons in order to share our experiences in this very nice field that I think that it's ear surgery. And no matter if you use an endoscope, if you use a microscope, uh, you are still an ear surgeon. You are not a surgeon of the tool, you are a surgeon of the ear. And here I will quote a phrase from a mayor of New York. In 1889, New York had a mayor, Hugh J. Grant. And Thomas Edison uh, wanted to put some lights in the streets of New York to illuminate the streets. Because in the past, the streets were illuminated by, by uh, candles or by lights, by oil or by gas. So Edison presented the light and the mayor, when saw the project, said, no, 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 we don't need lights in New York. We have plenty of candles. So imagine, uh, if you have a very good instrument, if you have a very nice instrument, and if you can perform surgeries in a very uh, minimal invasive way, having the same or even better results than the traditional instruments, why not? So some surgeons, they say, no, I have the microscope, I can stay with the microscope, I have good results with the microscope. Okay, okay, but we are showing to you a tool, an endoscope, that in many, many, many hands, and many, many, many hands throughout the world, can have better results, in some cases, when compared to microscopic only surgery. So you can have endoscopic only surgery, you can have combined approach, and you can have better results. So why don't use an endoscope? Uh, as a tool in order to complete or in order to start your surgery. So I think um, we have had a lot of resistance in the past, but now I think people, surgeons, are realizing uh, that this tool is a very important tool uh, in order to have good results and in order to have a minimal invasive way to treat uh, patients both in inflammatory conditions but also in tumor conditions. So now we perform the transcanal, transcochlear approach to the inner ear and I repeat with no retroarticular incisions. Now we are doing an infracochlear approach uh, to go uh, to the petrous apex. So in this infracochlear approach you have to take care of three uh, important things. First of all, anteriorly you have the internal carotid artery. Inferiorly, you have the jugular bulb, and if you have a high jugular bulb, this approach can be very tricky and very difficult. And superiorly, you have the promontory. Of course, in this case, the promontory, the cochlea was already open, but in a normal case, if you want to perform just an infracochlear approach, you cannot open the cochlea because you want to preserve the hearing. So, uh, in this case, also was nice because we, are use, we were using uh, a Medtronic image guidance system and you could see on the image guidance system the tunnel and you could follow the tunnel all the way to the petrous apex. Of course, in some patients you don't have this tunnel and the petrous apex is not pneumatized. But in the patients that the petrous apex is pneumatized, you can look for the tunnel because most of the times the, tu the tunnel is there and the tunnel can be used as a pathway uh, to the petrous apex. So uh, we did in this case the transcochlear approach infracochlear approach and we use the route between the fustis and the funiculus using landmarks the carotid artery the jugular bulb and uh, the promontory and now we are doing the uh, supra uh, cochlear approach supra cochlear approach has the superior limit uh, middle fossa the dura mater of the middle fossa and the inferior limit you have the jingle gangle but you have to remember you have to imagine that uh, if you are going to perform this approach you have to have space to have space, you have to have disease, because the disease will generate space for you. And the disease are uh, variable. You can have, for instance, a facial nerve neuroma, you can have a tumor in the region of the facial nerve, and you can have also uh, a cholestatoma. And the cholestatoma, if you, if you have a disease, you can have space. So you can open here, uh, the, expose the dura of the middle fossa, 
And sometimes if the disease goes into the brain, you can open the dura and you are in the middle fossa. If the disease doesn't, you can follow the dura. And if you follow the dura, you go all the way to the petrous apex. So it's very important to understand uh, this anatomy. So we are already in the dura of the middle fossa. And the dura is very, very, very easy to find. It's a very small, thin bone that you have in the supratubal recess that uh, protects the dura. So you can remove this bone using a drill or using a curette in this dissection, for instance. And you can see, you can expose the middle fossa dura. And you can open the middle fossa dura if you want. And you go to the middle fossa. But you can follow the dura, not opening the dura. And you can go all the way to the petrous apex in the superior part. In this part, just to demonstrate, we're going to open the dura. Just to demonstrate uh, here uh, the approach to the middle fossa. So just opening the dura and then you can put an endoscope and uh, of course this is just a demonstration of the inner ear roots that you can have uh, inside here uh, to understand the transcanal endoscopic roots that you can have to demonstrate the approaches, uh, the dissection approaches, the anatomical approaches to the inner ear. Of course uh, we have written a, a paper with uh, our friends Professor Livio Presuti, Professor Daniele Marchioni, and Dr. Moas Tarabishi, in order to understand this anatomy, this inner ear anatomy. So we have done a lot of dissections, and uh, uh, using the dissection uh, experience that uh, we could acquire, uh, we have uh, written uh, those chapters and uh, sometimes uh, chapters in the, the book uh, to understand the approaches uh, to the inner ear. So it's very important for us to understand that and very important for us uh, to understand this region. The protympanic space is over there and the protympanic space I think is yet an area to be uh, in, described in uh, an endoscopic fashion. So I think the endoscopic anatomy of the protympanic space is uh, a thing that's going to come out uh, real soon uh, by some uh, of, of us from the group in order to describe some bone reads that we can have there and we see those bone reads quite often when we dissect in, in live patients and I think those bone reads can be very important anatomical landmarks for both the eustachian tube opening and for the internal carotid artery when we talk about uh, new procedures or when we talk about new ways of addressing the eustachian tube using the middle ear as uh, the, 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 the conduit of this. So this is a demonstration because now we open everything <laughs> in the middle ear and in the inner ear. And now we are going to demonstrate how to harvest uh, the tragal cartilage because this is most of the times the only incision that you, you, you will have, the only visible incision that you have. So you do uh, an incision and this incision is not done in the edge of the tragal cartilage but uh, more posteriorly. And then you can use a scissor to dissect the cartilage the tragal cartilage uh, and also you can uh, dissect with perichondrium and of course you have to preserve a little bit of this tragal cartilage especially the most uh, uh, the most part of outside of this uh, tragal cartilage in order to preserve this tragal cartilage in order to uh, not have deformities in this tragal area so uh, you open here uh, this uh, 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 this dissection and you see uh, the tragal cartilage and of course you will remove the tragal cartilage um, uh, with the perichondrium and of course from both sides and here when you are going to pass from one side to the other side you have to preserve this cartilage more and more uh, lateral cartilage because this will uh, keep the tragal area in its shape you will not have deformities post-operative deformities and most important nowadays the patient will uh, be able to wear uh, earphones so nowadays uh, most of the people uh, they have uh, 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 smartphones and sometimes they run and sometimes they want to use uh, small earphones and if you remove uh, completely uh, the tragal cartilage I know it's glory I would say like this you can have deformities and those deformities can cause some um, static problems of your patients and nowadays uh, the patient cannot wear those earphones because the earphones will not have place to stay so the earphones are going to 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 to, to fall down so we are removing uh, the tragal cartilage 
And once you remove the trigger cartilage, you can have a slicer, a cartilage slicer, and then you can slice this cartilage if the cartilage is thick enough, and then you can create up to one, two, or even three uh, uh, pieces of cartilage that you can use uh, to do uh, the reconstruction. Of course, you have cartilage, but also you have perichondrium. And with the perichondrium, uh, you can have other types of tissue uh, in order to close uh, the tympanic perforations, for instance, or in order to close the attic defect that you're going to create, for instance, in some times. So now we are removing the cartilage, and you can remove a very big piece of cartilage, even saving uh, this most uh, lateral part of the trago area. You can use conchal cartilage if you want. You can use septal cartilage if you want. Uh, and of course, uh, at, at, at the end you just do a one or two stitches you can have even an absorbable stitch uh, if you don't want to remove the stitch but uh, sometimes most of the times I use a nylon uh, four zero nylon in order to uh, close the skin and I uh, remove the nylon one week uh, five days after the surgery so uh, and th this is the only incision that you have so, uh, with the cartilage, you can have a slicer, and then you can have some pieces of cartilage to, to, to reconstruct your defect. And of course, if you have a very thick cartilage, I think it's very useful to use the slicer. Otherwise, uh, sometimes you can have some uh, problem, uh, problems uh, in the mobility of the tympanic membrane. But if you have a very thin uh, cartilage, uh, the cartilage acts just like perichondrium, very thin cartilage, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeter cartilage. The cartilage acts just like fascia, just like perichondrium when you reconstruct uh, the tympanic membrane. If you have a thick cartilage, sometimes you can have problems. If you have a thin cartilage, the cartilage acts like uh, fascia or like uh, a perichondrium. So in this case, uh, we didn't have slicer, but the cartilage was not so big. So we have one cartilage there. And we can trim the cartilage according to the defect that you created. And you have one perichondrium. Actually, you have two perichondriums. Because you have perichondrium from one side and perichondrium from the other side. And you have to remember, perichondrium is not skin. Perichondrium is perichondrium. So, perichondrium is not skin. So, you can position the perichondrium according to what you want. As long as the perichondrium is under the skin. So, you can put one side, the other side is not skin. So we put the cartilage over there to uh, correct the defect that you created. But of course, there are some uh, parts that uh, the cartilage are not uh, is not covering. And then you can use a perichondrium, the perichondrium that you remove from the cartilage. And already, also, if you have, and of course, the tympanometal flap and the skin that you can use to put. Uh, after you position the cartilage and after you position the perichondrium, you can position the skin back again and with no retroauricular incisions, no or almost no drilling, mastoid preservation, you can have approaches or you can demonstrate the anatomy all the way from the middle ear to the mastoid because you can see the mastoid antrum and the inner ear using the three approaches that we, we can understand. The infracochlear approach, the transcochlear approach and the supracochlear approach. So I think, I really think, that endoscopic ear surgery nowadays is uh, gaining a lot of popularity, especially uh, in countries or in regions like uh, Latin America. I really think endoscopic ear surgery is going to be a game changer in ear surgery. And I, re I really, really think that uh, the results that we are having so far are very nice very promising especially for diseases like cholesteatoma and I think the future of your surgery will pass uh, through endoscopic procedures microscope will still be used and it's very useful to be used in the mastoid but I really think that endoscopes are a very nice tool and a superior tool in the middle ear so thank you very much for your time thank you very much for the dissection the specimen Thank you very much.